those of you who are in Europe or, or in, in uh, Russia or in Ukraine. Uh, welcome to this event of the Institute for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at GW, discussing separate ways public opinion in divided Donbass. We are now just a few days after the sixth anniversary of the Minsk II agreements, and that's a reminder, a sad reminder on how much the Donbass conflict is enduring as a territorial and geopolitical division. And we have today a great uh, transatlantic team of researchers who organized simultaneous surveys on public opinion on both sides of the divide in the Donbass in the fall of 2020. So it's really exceptional to have such fresh data. And we are really um, thanking everybody, our three speakers, for uh, uh, presenting that data uh, uh, today, discussing the research, what they found, how attitudes are changing. So. We will have three speakers. I will present them in a second. Then we will have a Q&A session. We will ask people to ask their question in the chat box. And then they will be giving the floor to speak out uh, their question. I also wanted to remind everybody that we are recording and we are on Facebook Live also. So let's now move to our three speakers. You can read their uh, longer bio on the website. Let me just briefly present them. We will first have uh, uh, John Olofin, College Professor of Distinction at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Then Gwendolyn Sasse, Director of the Center for East European and International Studies in Berlin and Senior Research Fellow at uh, uh, Nuffield College and College the University of Oxford. And then Girard Toll, Professor of Government and International Affairs at Virginia Tech Campus in Arlington. So once again, thank you so much for being here today to present that exceptional data you collected and I'm giving you the floor. So John, would you like to begin? Uh, GW and um, the, the uh, Ponars for, the, for this uh, presentation opportunity uh, and good morning and good evening to everybody. Um, we're, this is going to be like a, a relay race um, in the sense that I will start the presentation, then I'll hand it over to Gwen, and then she will hand it over to Jared, and then we will have uh, questions and answers. Um, so the um, the main um, idea here, of course, is to not only present our new data, but also to make a comparison to the data that Gwendolyn Center collected in um, 2019. They, they also did a, a previous survey in 2016. So in a sense, there are three uh, sets of survey data from uh, the Donbass region on both sides of the line of contact. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and um, we will uh, go from there. Okay, um, so we're um, titling this separate ways, um, public opinion and divided on pass, and it's separate in, in two dimensions, really. Uh, one, of course, separate across the line of contact, and secondly, um, geographically separated, I suppose, and then separated also in terms of preferences, uh, blame, and also uh, trust in the authorities to provide um, services and public goods to the respective populations. Um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge again the funding we have for this project from the National Science Foundation in the US, uh, from RCUK, the Research Council of the United Kingdom, and our partner, uh, Kristen Bakke, in, uh, University College London, and then uh, from ZOAS uh, Gwendolyn Center in Berlin. Um, so I don't need to go into uh, great detail because presumably most people online are familiar with the um, situation, but just to clarify what we are comparing. If you look at the map, um, we are looking at a divided um, two oblasts, uh, Luhansk and Donetsk, and then we are looking at um, the two areas that are shaded in yellow, uh, which we will refer to as the government controlled areas. Uh, and then we're also looking at the blue areas on the map, which are the two republics, uh, People's Republics, Donetsk People's Republics, and Luhansk People's Republics. And the line, uh, of course, of control is, is identified here, about 420 kilometers long. By background, um, I should kind of indicate the population numbers. Uh, and these are, of course, are very rough estimates. And, uh, and um, because there is significant movement out of the region, 
Um, the numbers are changing actually quite quickly, but according to, <clears throat> well, let's start at 2014, before the conflict began, uh, there were about 6.6 .6 million people in the two oblasts. Then, um, if you look at the kind of more recent estimates, the People's Republic of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk estimate together about 3.7 million. But there's a general agreement that this is an exaggeration, that the numbers are actually significantly smaller. Um, the Ukrainian government estimates about 3 million. Uh, Von Twickel in a book, uh, Beyond Frozen Conflict, in his, in his chapter in that book, he estimates it's about 1.7 million. Um, the, because of the large outflow um, of about 1.5 million from the People's Republics to Ukraine, and then about 600,000 to Russia, the numbers have really uh, dropped dramatically. Um, in terms of the population on the other side of the line of contact, um, I think the current best estimate is around two and a half, 2.6 million. So altogether, if you put in the uh, uh, estimates on both sides of the line of contact, it's about 4.3 million, which is again down significantly from the 6.6 .6 that was there um, seven years ago. Okay, so I'm sorry. There's a little delay in, in this. Um, the, I was going to show you a, uh, a map um, that shows the line of contact and the uh, number of violations counted by the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, but it uh, doesn't uh, really uh, matter for purposes of our uh, discussion because um, the key point from that map and the report that recently came out of events in 2020 show that the number of ceasefire violations is down significantly, especially since July, last July. Um, but there are still um, 134,000 ceasefire violations last year, all along, almost all along the line of contact. Um, so it's in a sense uh, stable, more stable now than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, but it's, it's unstable in the sense that there are constant uh, events, constant incidents uh, in the region. Um, I will turn now to the, um, the survey data that we're going to present. Um, so again, uh, there are two separate um, kind of independent but coming together uh, surveys. Uh, the one I'll talk about first is the one that uh, was done for us uh, for this joint project with uh, Kristen Bakke, University College London. And that was done in September. It was finished on the 1st of October. Um, and it um, was again on both sides of the line with two separate companies. Um, our thinking here was that um, if we uh, chose two uh, companies that have a high degree of reliability, and kind of reputational uh, quality, as well as real quality in terms of the work they've done in the past. And we have also cooperated with them both uh, in the past. And we hired them to do the survey at the same time, using exactly the same questionnaire with exactly the same data, sorry, the same data collected. Then um, we would, in a sense, have uh, a real comparison on both sides of the line of contact. Our thinking was, that if uh, on the government control side, KIS, um, the group from Kiev were doing the survey, the response rates would likely be higher. And similarly, if we were doing the survey in the People's Republics, if the Levada Center in Moscow was doing the calling, that the response rates uh, would be higher and that people were more likely to, um, to reply. So you ha have on here then, uh, how we did it. It's computer assisted telephone interviews on both sides. It's, um, you can see the contact rate uh, has to do with uh, who answers the phone basically. And then the response rate is the ratio of people who um, took part in the survey as a result of the contacts. Um, and then of course, everything was controlled by supervisors later who call back uh, the interviewer, the interviewees and ask them about the, um, the survey. Um, the sample size is a thousand, approximately a thousand on each side of the uh, line of contact. As I said, it's um, telephone surveys necessarily must be short. Uh, we kept it within 15 minutes and uh, there are 29 questions on here. 
Um, the ZOAS uh, survey in February and March of 2019 was similar in the sense that the uh, telephone survey was done in the uh, what's on here as the NGCA, the non-government control area, or the People's Republics. Um, that was a, a telephone survey of 1,200. And then on the other side, in the government controlled areas, it was face-to-face -face, uh, interviews. Um, and it was conducted by a group from Archive uh, or Research. There's some more detail at the bottom about the, um, the um, method of surveying, but it's a pretty standard procedure of stratification and then random sampling. Okay, so what I want to do is present some kind of, I'll present two slides and then I'll turn it over to Gwen. Uh, one of the kind of interesting uh, and maybe most uh, insightful questions is uh, to whom do you attribute blame for the uh, conflict that's now been going on for um, about almost seven years? and has led to the deaths of about 14,000 people and obviously the displacement of uh, millions more. And again, this was a question that was asked um, by the um, ZOAS group in Berlin in 2019, and we repeated the uh, question. And I, I'll, we have um, published some of these slides before uh, in a recent uh, Monkey Cage uh, article in the Washington Post uh, last Friday and also more recently, a couple of days ago, in uh, Global Voices. Um, and so, in a sense, there's a little bit more detail there or more uh, than I'm going to present a summary slide, but we want to kind of parse um, some of the uh, data more carefully. Anyway, um, this slide, and all these slides, by the way, um, the DNR, LNR, the People's Republics are in the kind of orangish, reddish colors, and the government control areas are on the bluish colors. And the two bars here represent the kind of summary, um, of the percentage of respondents in each of those two areas uh, responding to each of these options. The key takeaway point here is that if you look at the blue bars, there is more of a distribution of blame across the different options. In other words, it's kind of a mixed opinion about who is to blame. Uh, what's interesting about the blue bars is that the plurality, the highest number of responses, around 32%, about a third of the respondents blame equally the Russian and Ukrainian governments. Um, by contrast, in the uh, People's Republics, you'll see the blame, if you add up the blame here, which is around 42%, the Ukrainian government, and then you add the West to it, um, which was one of the options, which is another 22%, you, you see that almost half, um, um, sorry, that uh, almost two thirds of the respondents blame um, the West and Ukraine together. So again, quite a uh, difference across the uh, line of contact in terms of blame. So now, um, if we compare those results of blame to the ZOAS results, they're actually quite similar. Again, you can see here the mixed bars, the mixed, um, sorry, the mixed blame um, sorry, and I was the mixed blame uh, on the um, Ukra uh, Ukrainian government control side. This is the blue bars on here, and how it's uh, different. Um, Western intervention gets about 20%, Ukraine government about 12%, and so on. Um, by contrast, if you look at the um, People's Republics, there, um, the, the options were slightly different, but the intent, I think, is still the same. Western intervention, about 40%, and then the Ukrainian government, about 10%. So about, again, half uh, blaming uh, the Ukrainian government or the West. And so here is the um, question that uh, asks people, what is their preferred future status, assuming at some point um, there will be a kind of a move away from the um, rather intense um, fighting uh, over the last few years um, to uh, questions about the, the long-term outcome, the long-term political outcomes of the area. And the question is, what do people want and what do they prefer? So here we see a clear divide. Um, we see that in uh, the government controlled areas, the blue bars here, 
um, you can see very uh, directly that 55% uh, would say they should be the People's Republic should be back in Ukraine without any autonomy, without any kind of local uh, political controls. Um, another 20% are willing to accept a return with some kind of autonomy uh, in in Ukraine, within Ukraine. So again, if you add it together, about three quarters want uh, the People's Republic's back uh, in uh, in Ukraine. By contrast, of course, on the other side, uh, the bars are very different, where here <clears throat> you see uh, half, um, close to half, uh, preferring to, uh, to join Russia. And so um, this is a, uh, oh, by the way, we also had uh, some small uh, numbers who um, opted for the independence uh, option, which we added uh, in 2020, thinking that perhaps just giving a binary option of Ukraine on the one side and Russia on the other side was too blunt. And, and if we added in the independence option, perhaps that might be of interest to people, but actually it's very, very small. It's less than 10% um, of independence and, and also very small numbers who want to go back to Ukraine, about 10%. The other thing about these graphs is that the numbers of people who don't know are quite high. It's, it's close to 20%, 15 to 20% of people um, in, in, uh, in these surveys. Now, here's the contrast with the uh, ZOAS data. In 2019, um, and I, I, it's worth kind of uh, looking a little bit more carefully at this one. The options are basically the same, you know, in Ukraine with autonomy, in Ukraine without autonomy, in Russia with autonomy, in Russia without autonomy. The ZOA survey did not have the independence option on there, but um, the numbers are so small that probably doesn't affect the results a huge amount. Um, but again, it is consistent on the government control side. That is, the numbers who want the People's Republics back in Ukraine with um, with or without autonomy is still about three quarters. Um, but the difference is on the People's Republic side. Uh, here they're very different. 30 cent, um, 38% um, on the ZOAS surveys um, in the People's Republic said they wanted to join Ukraine. And we have only about 10%. And uh, here um, it's really uh, quite dramatic that the numbers who want to join Russia in the ZOA survey are lower than the numbers who want to join um, Ukraine or want to rejoin Ukraine. Uh, the numbers of don't knows are about the same. So um, this is a kind of a big and really the only sizable difference in the two surveys um, in terms of the other questions, in terms of the distributions of answers, um, they're actually very, very similar. But on this one, uh, there is so some difference. Okay, I'll stop at this point and turn it over to Gwen, who's going to continue. Thank you very much, John. And the relay race continues. I'll try and share the screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Perfect. Um, yeah, maybe I can just add on, on the Zoe's data. I mean, first of all, the data from 2016 and 2019 um, didn't show major differences when we look at this question. Um, so there were mainly smaller changes within the categories or between the categories with staying within Ukraine or uh, becoming part of Russia. Um, so no significant um, change across um, those two uh, categories. Um, I just wanted to um, briefly add that um, the very striking difference we see here, and um, we frame that carefully, and, and John already said that um, the data was collected differently, and we don't know if, if that also affects um, the data. And I just want to say that our research is, is not actually based in the Kharkiv, but it is a UK-based company that specializes in opinion poll research um, in Eastern Europe and other also conflict um, zones. And at the time, we our strategy um, in those surveys was to go for a survey company outside with local 
um, research as a network of local researchers, but not to go for the, the, the main ones. I think it's also a matter of timing when these surveys are conducted. But the phone calls were carried out from Kharkiv. Um, so that was also a deliberate choice close um, to or closer um, to uh, the non-government controlled areas. Um, if we uh, look at maybe a related question, not so much the status per se, but uh, trust, um, arguably the question about status, um, and that's how it was phrased, by the way, in the survey, a special status. So we didn't, um, in the choice surveys, use the, the um, emotionally loaded and politically loaded term or autonomy. Um, but maybe that is too abstract in many ways uh, for people, one could say. So maybe the question about trust um, was our reasoning in the in the new surveys um, gets you closer to what people think of local authorities, not necessarily speculating about what has to come um, in, in the future. Um, and what you see here, however, it backs up that there has been a shift or that there's something going on with the population, the resident population of the non-government um, controlled areas. Um, trusting uh, their local authorities at least more than the resident population of the government controlled areas of the Donbas um, do. So again, here in red um, are the non-government controlled areas and blue the government controlled areas. And we move from trust to neither trust nor distrust um, to um, distrust and don't know and refused. And you can uh, see those figures here in the non-government controlled areas, um, uh, about 26% is the bar here, say they trust local authorities, but then about 48%, the next uh, red bar, um, say they neither trust nor distrust, and distrust stands at about 18%. Um, now, I um, take this as more trust in local authorities in um, those parts of the Donbas, but I also think for actually both uh, the non-government and the government controlled areas, there's a large share that says it neither distrusts nor um, trusts the authorities. And that is probably a reflection of um, the population having to get on with their lives and not um, holding out much hope for, for the authorities to take care of their concerns. But if we look at um, the government controlled areas, it is um, striking that, that there seems to be a parallel in the middle category but for in terms of distrust, it is much more pronounced there. Um, the, the figure is 45% um, said they distrust um, the local authorities or in the government controlled areas. Now, it, in, in terms of context, it's important, and that's probably reflected in this data, that many of the local authorities on the government controlled side of the Donbas haven't been uh, functioning uh, properly. So uh, or properly in a sense of how we think of local authorities, um, many um, authorities are under civil military um, uh, administration and also in the last local elections, um, many uh, local councils did not participate or were not allowed or couldn't participate in the elections. So the estimate is that there's about 450,000 citizens disenfranchised when we think of electoral participation and representation. So this is um, no doubt also elected in this, um, reflected in this data. But I think it's a quite strong verdict on in particular the the uh, local um, sentiment in the government controlled areas that their um, needs um, as, as citizens are not um, taken care of at the moment. If we break this down by age, uh, we see an, an interesting reverse uh, pattern. And again, um, the non-government controlled areas here in, in red and the government controlled Donbas in blue. So if we just focus on distrust and trust, uh, we see um, uh, that uh, a reverse uh, pattern so that the older population um, in the government controlled Donbas uh, distrusts local authorities more. Um, whereas if we look through the, through the trust category, we see that older people trust um, the local authorities and the non-government controlled areas more. Um, the latter surprised me a little given that um, many older people still regularly travel as best as they can, in particular before the corona restrictions additionally came in or what was passed off as corona restrictions, cross the, the, the contact line and uh, collect um, their, their pensions on the government controlled side. So I'm not quite sure how that can be combined with um, this, this, this higher trust here. But this is sort of data, I think, that, that um, uh, backs up um, the, the trend we see through a cautious comparison 
um, between the 2019 and now 2020 uh, data on the status. And I think I, yes, sorry, Gerard, I already pass on to you. My stretch was a little shorter. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, so I'm, I am going to talk about um, just uh, one question, really, which is uh, a question that um, is somewhat different from the others, uh, but it's inspired by a desire to try to get outside of the categories that conflict researchers uh, often use. And uh, so when we do research in a particular area, we are, of course, very interested in the status questions and questions concerning the trust of authorities uh, and the like. But um, often that doesn't capture the fact that most people are concerned with everyday concerns. And a lot of people do not think in political terms and they're not interested in politics. Um, and so this particular question emerged uh, in part from, uh, from research that I had done in the past in, in Bosnia, but then also from uh, the reporting of, of Tim Judah uh, uh, on Eastern Ukraine. In particular, this particular section of his uh, report, which was first in the New York Review of Books and then later became a book that is probably well known to you. But he interviews a, a, a young woman called Victoria. And she says to him, it does not matter if I live in Russia or Ukraine, all I want is a good salary. Um, and so we talked to survey companies about this, and um, we also wanted to capture uh, those that are uh, retirees, pensioners. So we added pension uh, to the particular question. Uh, and the question uh, took the form uh, of the following. It does not matter what country I live in, all I want is a good salary and pension. And so we first asked this question in December of uh, 2014 uh, in uh, Southeast Ukraine. And those of you who are uh, conflict researchers will know the, uh, the, the particular research that we have done there in the past. I, I don't think we've reported out the answers to this particular question in this area. We weren't able to do all of the so-called eight claimed oblasts of uh, that were claimed as part of Nova Russia by the uh, the extreme Russian nationalists that went into that area and uh, uh, formed alliances with with other small groups of uh, extreme Russian nationalists there to try to break this area off as as a separate part of Ukraine as Nova Russia that that project that that failed uh, quite spectacularly but nevertheless significantly disrupted and destabilized uh, Southeast Ukraine. Um, so we asked that question and these are the results. Uh, now we haven't broken it down uh, by oblast, but as you can see, it's, it's a question that really divides, uh, gets uh, at um, an opinion and that opinion is very split. Uh, so you can see here strongly agree and agree with that, uh, about uh, you know forty eight percent or so, but disagree and strongly disagree, pretty much the same. And so the balance is with those that do do, uh, do not know or refuse. And um, so we ask this question then again uh, in the uh, two areas of the Donbass, uh, and the results are really very very interesting uh, because in one sense this question is a measure of dissatisfaction with the categories of the conflict, the territorial uh, claims, the claims to sovereignty and the like. It's also a measure of dissatisfaction with, um, with leadership. Um, and uh, it is, uh, in one sense, a public, a clear public goods theory of the state, that the state should be something that serves the needs of ordinary people uh, and that uh, that particular vision should be front and central. So, as you can see here, there is a strong agree on both sides of the line in the Donbass. 
with this. It's slightly higher in the government controlled areas. Uh, and then the disagree is, is much smaller in, in both of those areas. Um, so there's a 20 point difference within uh, the government controlled areas between agree and disagree. Uh, but it's close to that or a 16 plus point difference within the non-governmental controlled areas. Now, let's break it down by age group. Um, and I use, I'm using two terms here. I'm, I'm using the term Soviet generation. And what I mean by that is those that are over 60. So that those that were full adults that were 30 years old or older when the Soviet Union collapsed. So they were socialized within the Soviet Union. They're now uh, in the 60 and over category. Um, so in the Soviet generation is more likely to agree in the government controlled areas, but also, and I'm using a second term here, post-Soviet generation, those under the age of 30, those that have no memory of the Soviet Union, were not born in the Soviet Union, or if they were born, they were really newborns. Um, so, so half of that post-Soviet generation also agree in the government controlled areas. Now, let's look at the non-governmental controlled areas. Two thirds of the post Soviet generation, so the young uh, under 30s, agree with this sentiment uh, in the um, DNR, LNR uh, controlled territories. Um, and let's look at those that are most likely to disagree, which is a minority sentiment overall. So, one third of the Soviet generation in the DNR. Uh, are likely to disagree with that. So it's not simply that the Soviet generation uh, is not thinking in territorial terms. Um, and then 45% of the 31 to 45 year old cohort in the government controlled areas. So those that are full, uh, full adults now, many of them or some of them may be in the, serving in the, uh, in the defense forces or may have relatives in the defense forces or may have people that uh, have died as a consequence of this particular conflict. We, we just, we don't know uh, that. We're just looking at raw um, cohort uh, numbers here. Um, so then by nationality, um, so those that uh, ascribed their ethnic identity as Ukrainian or as Russian. So Ukrainians in the government controlled areas are slightly less likely to agree uh, with this, this particular sentiment uh, than in the DNR and the LNR. Whereas Russians, uh, ethnic Russians, those are the, the, they're Ukrainians, but they're uh, Ukrainian Russians, uh, in the government controlled areas are more likely to agree than in the DNR and LNR. Now, of course, we'll use the term Ukrainian Russian. Sometimes that's uh, that we're forcing identity into categories that in actuality may not be as clear uh, as they appear on, uh, on particular surveys. And so we have to bear in mind that there's a fluidity and hybridity to identities. Uh, and of course, the whole question of identity has reams and reams of scholarship and some of the folks that are uh, attending uh, uh, this particular presentation have written on this in, in great detail. Um, now, the agree-disagree gap is smallest, only 6% for Russians in uh, the non-governmental controlled areas, whereas it is 30% for Ukrainians. And the gap uh, in the government controlled areas, it's largest for Russians, uh, whereas it's uh, only 14% for Ukrainians. Now, some conclusions to this research. Um, this is a, a, a difficult conflict. It is a, um, an ugly conflict, bitter conflict. Uh, it is one that is hard to research uh, and it is hard to uh, be neutral in, in this conflict. Um, but there's a few things that we can find out from this really, in one sense, a second round of research. And hopefully there will be further re rounds of uh, research. Uh, that will then be able to situate this research within, within a, a, a time series. Um, so the enduring differences on who is responsible for the war, that's quite clear from uh, the particular research that we're presenting here. 
But what is also intriguing is there seems to be an evolving difference on orientation, or at least the second survey has captured something that the first survey did not. Uh, and, um, and then the, it's an open question as to whether future surveys will affirm that or, uh, or, or not. Um, there's significant discontent within, uh, with general conditions in the government controlled areas of Ukraine. It's less apparent in the non-governmental controlled areas, uh, but there's still a large share of a, a, a population there which is disaffected. Uh, and so that is uh, quite significant. There is also, as you can see from the Victoria question, significant sentiment for a sort of deterritorialized vision is that the particular categories that we're all using, were, which flag flies where, uh, who is in control, is it pro-Russia, is it pro-Ukraine, um, and you know the fact that those things are made binaries, um, there's significant sentiment against that. And so that, I think, is, is worth uh, doing further research on. I think one of the values of, of this research is that we're hearing the silent, silenced in certain instances majority, because there is repression uh, in these areas. These are areas that are not free in terms of uh, their media. Uh, and those of you who pay any attention to it will, will be very aware of uh, all of the information blockages and controls. Of, of media and the like. So what we would uh, uh, submit is that this research allows local voices and on the ground perspectives. Um, there's a challenge here uh, to the authorities on, on either side to acknowledge alternative narratives amidst a bitter and it's a multi-scalar conflict. Um, but those, those particular narratives, uh, those are um, not something that you can dismiss as fake news or as disinformation. These are deeply held uh, and alternative understandings of the conflict, and they need to be engaged and recognized. And one of the challenges here is to accept that people have different views, to accept that particular plurality and that difference. Um, and that's a challenge for authorities on both sides. It is a, a very common reaction when you do not get results that you do not like to find the conspiracy which explains why these particular results are not the ones that you like. And so you would say, well, it is TV propaganda and the people uh, in non-governmental controlled areas are therefore somewhat captive uh, to media and therefore um, are somehow um, uh, captured by that and cannot think for themselves. And that, in one sense, assumes people are autonom automatons, that they do, uh, do not have their own particular uh, a perspective. We're trying to give you a sense uh, of that larger perspective with this research. Um, and uh, I think we will, uh, I will stop here and uh, turn it over for questions. Thank you so much, John, Gwendolyn, Gira, for this it's really fascinating uh, data and presentation you gather. So congratulations for the, the ongoing research project. So there are a lot of questions in the chat box already. And so as we said, we would be inviting uh, people uh, to the floor, to take the floor and to ask their question. And Gira, I would like to give you the floor back so you can uh, decide and invite people to uh, join the discussion. Sure. Okay. Well, um, I see a, a question from the get-go uh, from uh, Dr. Vladimir Kolosov, uh, who is uh, a, a researcher in, in Russia that we have done a lot of work with in the past, and so I would invite him to um, to ask his question. Okay. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to ask. Um, how do you explain the difference between the results of 2019 and 2020? Perhaps it's the effect of presidential elections in Ukraine, the hopes related with the election of President Zelensky. Uh, it's my first question. The second question is, we explained in the past the difference between uh, Ukrainian, Ukraine-controlled territories and um, 
Donetsk and Lugansk republics by the effect of the impact of TV. There were uh, correlations, uh, uh, strong correlations. Is it the explanation now or you have different options, different versions? And it may ask, uh, add this, the third question. Did you see any difference between Donetsk and Luhansk? Uh, geographical difference because uh, your data were differentiated. Okay, terrific. Um, I, now, I, if we could go to a second question, and I think we'll take three questions and then I turn it over if that's okay, uh, Marlene. So the second would be uh, Nareg uh, Seferian, who had a question about uh, uh, phone systems. Hello, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I wanted to ask, yes, about how telephones work in the area you did, you conducted your, your uh, survey through the phones. I was wondering if it's still landlines or if the cell phones, if there are a number of different cell phone companies that are more dominant. And if you took those different companies into consideration when you came up with your, um, I guess, representative, but still random numbers to call, maybe some of those companies have certain political affiliations or tied to oligarchs, things like that. I was curious about your methodological approach. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, last but not least, uh, Keith uh, Darden uh, wanted to ask a, a question. Uh, and first, just to say thank you guys for doing this survey, it's amazing. So uh, my question is, you know, given that people in these regions generally assume that wages and pensions are higher in Russia, is it possible that the question about wages and pensions is actually a proxy for whether uh, whether you're comfortable joining Russia, where people in the government controlled areas might not feel comfortable answering uh, a question that would uh, basically uh, um, implicate them in treason? <laughs> and so this might be a politically more acceptable way for them to say that they're comfortable not being part of Ukraine. Okay, uh, so uh, Jono, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I I'll start. Um, well, uh, actually, these are these are difficult questions, uh, except from the one from Marek, which is, uh, I think, pretty uh, straightforward in terms. Of, and I think there was another question also about the uh, phone um, surveys, the the um, the sampling methodology. Yeah, one from Alexander Murray, who asked about. Uh, was it landlines or cell phones or subscribers to a single service like Vodafone and so on? Um, so uh, I know a little bit about this, but I, I don't know the actual kind of uh, intricate details. Um, when uh, I was talking to Levada about this phone survey, uh, that was, of course, one of the key questions that came up was about which kinds of phones would they reach, landlines or cell phones or um, cell phones of some companies and other companies and, and so on. And they um, said that they have a list of both landlines and cell phones uh, registered in the Donbass, in the, uh, sorry, the People's Republics, uh, the DPR and, um, and uh, LPR. And what they said was that um, they had previously done uh, phone surveys there, I think mostly for consumer type stuff um, and that they were confident that they had essentially access to the numbers of uh, people in the area. The problem, and, and I, I know Gwen is familiar with this, is that um, with cell phones, people, of course, change their SIM cards all the time. And the hit rate in the People's Republics for phones, in other words, active phones, uh, was uh, quite low in the sense that uh, a lot of numbers simply were no longer in service because of this cell phone uh, jumping that goes on. And um, so when they um, made the calls, uh, the ratio of uh, live phones, for the better term, uh, was, was, it seemed to me anyway, significantly lower than on the uh, government control side. But it was an attempt to reach both uh, landlines and cell phones, I, I will say that. Um, the other thing is, um, about the uh, question from Vladimir, um, which is a good question, but um, the 
comparison between the uh, Luhansk and uh, Donetsk uh, uh, parts uh, of the um, non-government controlled areas. Um, actually, Vladimir, I haven't looked at it in details, but there doesn't seem to be any significant differences just on these key questions that we talked about today. In other words, the ratios are not significantly different. But I think it's certainly worth something uh, probing. Um, and then, um, if I can also answer or try to answer um, about why um, the results are different, there are three possibilities here. Um, the first possibility is that because the uh, requests for interviews are coming from two different places, one from Kharkiv in the ZOA survey in 2019, and ours is coming from Moscow, from Nevada, right? That could influence the results. In other words, the uh, responses could be a function of who's making the call and who the, uh, the company is. That's one possibility. The second possibility is that things have changed. In other words, that um, the events, um, including the election that, that Vladimir mentioned between early 2019 and late 2020, um, are important enough, dynamic enough, that it could um, significantly change the results. Um, I will point out that with the exception of the status question, the uh, results are actually quite consistent in terms of blame, for example, um, between the ZOAS survey and, and the 2020 survey. Um, so that's a se second possibility. Um, and then, you know, related to that is the idea that lines are hardening, uh, that people in the um, living in the two republics, South and Third Republics, are um, becoming less um, open to the possibility of anything other than joining Russia, which then goes to uh, Keith's question, which I, I think is a very important one about wages and uh, pensions and, and so on. Um, if you look at the uh, chapter by Von Twickel in the book, um, The Unfrozen Conflict, there it is here, <laughs> um, which is a very long uh, chapter and, and a very informed chapter. He was an individual who uh, worked for the OSCE in the area for um, a long time, and this came out last year. Uh, he points out a couple of really interesting things about pensions. First of all, pensions in the People's Republics are half of what they are in both Ukraine and Russia. Um, and so, um, you know, there's not a huge difference between the pensions in Ukraine and the pensions in Russia, but there's a big, big difference between the pensions in the republics now and the pensions uh, on the other in Russia and in Ukraine. So this idea that maybe um, the sense of preferring to become part of Russia is pension driven, and wages driven, is a, is a real possibility. Uh, we have some other questions in the survey, which we didn't uh, talk about today, uh, asking you know, questions regarding um, material uh, status and uh, optimism about increasing incomes and all those kinds of things, which we can use to try and get at that. But I think it's a real uh, possibility that the expectations or the hopes for higher uh, incomes and pensions in Russia is driving the to some extent, the uh, preference for uh, Russian as a status uh, in the future. I'll stop there, Jared. You can take the other questions or when I want to challenge them. Gwen? Um, you've answered very comprehensively there already, um, uh, John. Just maybe, I, I think if we are capturing a moment and, and you phrase it very carefully because it could also mean that where the phone call is coming from and who is the person or the agency behind it has an impact we we, we can't um rule that out i think there's it, this might also capture a moment um where kind of the length of a of a war um sort of kicks in and how orientation adjusts to what doesn't seem to be a temporary um, state of affairs anymore so in addition to the other factors of uh, that I think are important possible explanations that hopes um, uh, that might have been there and when Zelensky um, sounded different um, initially reaching out also to the population in the non-government controlled areas. Um, I think it, it might also capture this um, realization that um, things are not um, going to go or not going to change and you adjust to that um, 
uh, setting. Um, I just also wanted to say on the pensions, I, I think that is a very interesting suggestion and, and, and we need to also see with the other questions if we can get at, at maybe some aspect of it. I think it might be more so sort of compelling with the wages argument. So I wonder if, um, I don't think the record is that, that pensions have been paid regularly in the non-government controlled areas and that this is sort of this very clear incentive also keeping in mind that um, some people collect pensions in two places and and that some may only have access to the pensions in the government controlled areas so i wonder i think that would might be quite hard to interpret for the older age group which we showed also was an, important in our data but i think on the wages and sort of what one expects of the economy in general, I think that in particular for other age groups, I think might be a good way of, of getting or another way of getting at least some of these questions. And as I'm just talking, I keep starting and ask another question. And I think I, I I probably didn't present that clearly enough when I talked about trust and the, the trust is in on the government control. The question is on the government controlled um, side in national government Kiev, but I, I um, try to say that I think that is not only feeling lost um, or left behind um, by the government in Kiev, not, not dealing enough with, with that area, but also in addition that fact that government in general isn't, isn't visible um, in, a, in a normal sense in, in those areas. But the question was about national government, so authorities, government, how it's conceived on both sides, which is obviously different, and on the um, uh, non-government controlled areas. There's also authorities can there could be different interpretations playing into that, but I think that seemed to ask the um, the, the 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 way to ask the trust question um, somewhat differently in both parts. Okay, um, let me just very briefly uh, address. I think he's an excellent question, and I would just caution against imposing a binary upon uh, a question which you know you're saying it's potentially a proxy for a uh, sentiment to to join russia and i you know i think we have to take the question of face value and it certainly it is an indication of uh, a lack of uh, well a disappointment uh, a failure of the ukrainian state to deliver um, but that's also true uh, on the other side uh, also. So um, I would be cautious about seeing it as a proxy for desire to, uh, to, to join Russia. I think that um, it is reasonable for people to aspire to a um, higher standard of living uh, and to ask uh, greater things of their state uh, and of the particular social services which they're not getting. Um, okay, um, let's go for uh, some more questions. So I see Julian, Julia, Julian Velkov, and then uh, then we'll go to Anthony, Anthony uh, Paquin, and then Hugo, Hugo Kligin, uh, and I apologize if I am uh, mispronouncing your name. So first, Julian. Hi, thank you very much for the amazing survey you just did. I happen to be in Ukraine and I was working in Donetsk for a year and a half. So I can say with confidence that the results you have been able to write down are actually accurate drawn from my own experience. My first question to you was whether since the time you have completed the survey, did you have any reaction of any kind coming from the U Ukrainian government? the same way the Ukrainian foreign minister last year uh, took the time to write an address uh, in the magazine Foreign Affairs. Thank you. Okay, Julian, uh, uh, Anthony. Jared, he can't, uh, he says he doesn't have a microphone, so you can't, maybe you have to read the question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Okay. Well, why don't we go to uh, Hugo, uh, and then I'll find his question. Hugo? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, it's Hugo Klein, by the way. It's, it's a Dutch name. I'm with the, <laughs> I'm with the Dutch uh, Klingendal Institute. Um, my question was about the, the results you presented, and they, they seem to indicate a, a cross-contact line divide and you also hinted at political disinterest. 
And my question was, what, what does that do with the, um, the, uh, the prospect of organizing local elections as per the Minsk agreement? I think as, as tradition has it, a lot of parties will want to organize or elections only once they know they, they're going to win. Um, but it is a, a, a part of the, uh, the Minsk agreements. Uh, so what, what, what does that say about the prospect of at some point in time having these, these elections? Thank you. Okay. Um, and Anthony's question was about, uh, um, that considering that Russia doesn't recognize uh, the DNR and LNR, or DNR and LNR, does this mean that Russia has more to win by letting the Donbass into Ukraine? I mean, that's a huge, huge issue uh, as to what Russia's uh, overall uh, position is, the Donbass, or at least the non-governmental controlled areas being a sort of in-between space. But I think one could argue that it's a um, created as such and functions as such for certain strategic reasons. Uh, do you want to uh, take these questions, uh, John? Yeah, you're on mute. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. Um, well, they're very difficult questions. I'm not so familiar with the local election scene right now. I, I think Gwen probably has more information about that, or maybe some others online could uh, comment as well. Um, and by the way, I, I appreciate uh, these comments a lot. Um, I hope we can um, keep the uh, chat as a record that we can uh, follow up uh, in terms of uh, probing and examining and um, trying to understand the factors behind these answers. Um, what we did today was just present really the first pass, um, you know, with reference to um, two key uh, demographic divides of age and nationality, but obviously there are lots of other uh, options. Um, if I could, um, I would answer one question now and then maybe uh, those questions you just asked heard could be uh, answered. Um, and the question was asked, and I've forgotten who it was. Uh, yeah, it was from uh, Mikhail Alexeyev um, in uh, San Diego, I think. Uh, who says that he's not surfing this morning <laughs> in order to uh, join us. So thanks. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the, the question was about um, exposure to violence being um, to some extent driving the answers. And um, this is a great question. And it's obviously something that uh, I have looked at in the past. Um, we actually asked uh, in these phone surveys, and this goes back to the kind of phone survey the nature of the question, we actually asked very precisely um, where the respondent was located, not only which village, um, but then within cities, and obviously there are some big cities here, uh, where uh, in the city the respondent was located. So we don't know, of course, if they themselves, um, you know, were in a war zone and perhaps moved, you know, right on the front line and perhaps moved. But we do know how close they are to the front line. And we do know uh, to some extent uh, where their current location is in terms of war exposure. Um, so that's definitely uh, something that we're, we plan to examine. Uh, and that's why we really got this very precise geographic location. Uh, I let Gwen answer the uh, tough questions. <laughs> Thanks very much. So I'll pass on to Gerard then. Now, um... On the local uh, elections issue, I mean, if I understand the question correctly, it's, I mean, they link with Min Minsk and when to hold local elections in the, the non-government controlled areas um, is, is, uh, is obviously a, a tricky issue when, and the Minsk agreement itself um, doesn't lay out exactly, or it, it tried once to lay out a sequence, but we're long beyond that, that sequence, so it's always about uh, the possibility of local elections when at the same time security guarantees for control, the Ukrainian um, state control, again, um, moving at least towards uh, the former state border with Russia or ideally already being there. So this conundrum, there has been much movement and it cannot really be, be resolved. Um, there was, and maybe that's what the question refers to as well, 
um, uh, Zelensky and his team seemed temporarily um, quite keen to hold local elections. On the one hand, it was, I think, some sort of a signal to Russia that one, one had to kind of revive um, negotiations in a different way. But I think there might have also been the hope that um, uh, Zelensky's um, uh, party and his, um, his political outlook could perhaps also appeal in, in, in those territories. So I think we're long beyond or we're, we're beyond that point now, that political point where any such thinking could even inform um, in Zelensky's political strategy. And I think it also inside Ukraine and, and around Zelensky, we now see a different policy um, materializing and it's not um, the, the Poroshenko line yet, but I think we're at a critical moment there where we see actually a move away from, from those suggestions to look at smaller compromises within within Minsk. So I think any local elections that would be acceptable to Ukraine or even international standards, um, um, that is that is a far off um, prospect. And I would also um, agree with the suggestion in there that uh, that that somebody I forgot the name now um, uh, made that it suits Russian um, interests well to to uh, not uh, completely um, integrate or try and integrate the Donbas like Crimea to completely annex it, but leave it as is and and thereby have leverage um, on Ukrainian politics. Um, and then at the same time, there's also. Um, increasingly no appetite in Russia for those types of things where you become fully um, uh, responsible forever um, uh, for the, the costs result, um, connected to this. We see this with regard to the, the enormous costs of the Crimean annexation. That's not called into question uh, by the Russian population, but there is a sense that this is costing uh, probably rather much more than, than was expected. So it would also, on the Kremlin's part, it would not, um, I think, be the the wise strategy to to force a similar scenario so it suits the interests um i think quite well and the way for, from the russian point of view from the kremlin's point of view uh, as it currently stands um i mean as the contact line so-called contact line was was mentioned maybe i just throw in uh kind of some analysis i've just been doing the last few days on on the choice data from from 2019 we see a clear um, correlation between the views on the future status uh, in, in um, the uh, non-government controlled areas um, with uh, whether people uh, cross this line at all and, and how frequently they cross it. So um, it, it demonstrates that the less there is this possibility to cross, as it's currently the case, um, uh, or if, if, if it becomes almost impossible, that is one factor that makes um, makes views drift uh, further apart. Uh, maybe I stop here for the moment. Have I forgotten anything? Over to you, Gerard. You pick up whatever was left. Probably tough questions too. Well, the the Ukrainian government uh, question about um, whether the Ukrainian government has been in touch with us or has responded or reacted to this data, and the answer is uh, no. We have had no communication with uh, the Ukrainian government uh, about this uh, particular uh, research uh, at all. And uh, that uh, essay that was referred to uh, from the Ukrainian foreign ministry, uh, foreign minister in foreign affairs was uh, a surprise uh, to us. And um, uh, we were given, I think, 100 words or even less to respond. And a lot more could be said. <laughs> Uh, in response to that. Uh, but I think that there, the larger issue is one that uh, we as researchers are concerned about, and that is that the pressure that is placed upon uh, independent uh, survey firms uh, in Russia and uh, in Ukraine, we hope that we are able to conduct this research again. We don't know that that's going to be possible because um, there has been pressure on Levada, there has been pressure on Kiss in, in the past. Uh, and um, I think that uh, we are trying to have a particular um, niche and uh, kind of maintain a space which is depoliticized, which is about kind of empirical research, which is about providing the results as they are, uh, as they emerge from these particular surveys. That is extremely valuable to all of the parties, 
Um, but that only happens when we have uh, firms that are depoliticized uh, and uh, we have them following the best scientific methods uh, and we have respect for, uh, for truth and for facts. Um, and um, so we're in a, obviously in a condition right now where all of those things are suddenly in question. Um, so um, other questions uh, that I see here, uh, I think we have um, covered uh, Mikhail's question. Uh, there's a question from uh, uh, Felix uh, Antoine uh, Couleture. Uh, where he is asking how the Donbass is different from other Eurasian de facto states. Uh, and then uh, Fabrizio Eva from uh, Italy uh, has a question. Um, do you uh, wish to ask your question, Fabrizio? Mm -hmm. Sí, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I'm particularly concerned about the concept of the deterritorialized de sentiment, uh, because one of, of my point is that uh, uh, the relation between human beings and, and territory and the physical territory is a sort of transferred idea. And so I, I wonder if uh, um, the divided line, the, the between the, the two part uh, has not uh, real, real physical point of reference, rivers, uh, uh, mountains, uh, uh, and so on. And so the perception of the separation, of the physical separation of the territory from the other side, on both sides, is not so clear, so, so evident. And maybe this, could this uh, explain this uh, sentiment of uh, deterritorialization. I don't know if my question is, is clear. Do you know that my English is not very smart? Uh, okay, thank you for that, Fabrizio. Uh, and lovely to hear from you again. Um, I think that uh, the division is very clear on the ground. I think that it is, uh, a, a quote unquote artificial divide in the same way as the IEBL in Bosnia was an artificial uh, divide. It is a front line that then became fortified uh, and a material reality on the ground. Um, what this underscores is the, I think, for people who uh, have lived in that area, in one sense, the absurdity of this is that because this did not uh, exist prior because it did not conform to any uh, well-known landmarks it, it, in terms of sort of natural, so-called natural geographic uh, borders, that um, there is a, you know, a massive frustration with this, that how did this uh, get created? Uh, and, um, and of course, that's the problem of borders. That's the problem of borders that uh, that I unfold um, as a consequence of, uh, of conflict. I do not think that the deterritorialized sentiment, and I, and I use that term um, uh, probably uh, in a way that carried in other things that, uh, that I shouldn't have, um, but I used it to try to rather get a sense, to, to push back at the notion that Everyone is invested in the territorial conflict uh, in both of these areas. Um, and so I think that uh, that's what I was trying to get at when I said deterritorialized. Um, so I hope that uh, addresses your question. Um, the other questions, uh, Jono, do you want to talk? Yeah, I'll take the uh, question from uh, Felix Antoine. Um, who asked about the um, comparison to other de facto states? Um, um, it's it's a it's a good question, of course, because um, this book I referred to by Duval and uh, Von Twickle, um, you know, they call it beyond frozen conflicts, and it's a comparison of the current situation in uh, de facto states uh, as well as Donbass, and so they. Um, 
have a very long chapter in there on Donbass, shorter chapters on Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and so on. Um, what I will say, uh, well, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, the, and I just make comparisons from our other surveys in those places in Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, and Karabakh. Um, we did ask that question that Jer talked about, the no matter where I live, um, you know, all I want is a good pension and a good job. Um, it, it, the same kind of breakdown is similar elsewhere. So in other words, about half of the population will agree with that sentiment, a half won't. And it seems to be quite consistent. Um, you know, we haven't probed it in detail, we probably should, in terms of the, does the kind of demographic lineup on the agreement change from location to location. Um, but I, I think uh, what Jared was emphasizing, I think is correct, and that is that the political question may not be as important as politicians and uh, other commentators tend to emphasize, in other words, to the exclusion of the kinds of concerns that people have in terms of their daily lives, in terms of uh, security of housing, and employment, and so on. The other comparison that's worth uh, making is that um, this question about status and about the future status and so on, it actually varies quite a bit from de facto to de facto. In other words, um, in some places, uh, it's about uh, unification with Russia, for example, in Transnistria, that's what they would like uh, for, the, for the most part. But in other places, it's highly varied, like in Abkhazia, it's uh, a strong uh, motivation on the part of the Abkhaz uh, population there for um, distancing or more independence from Russia. In Karabakh, it's absolutely split. Um, you know, between those who want to join Armenia and those who want independence. So we have um, in the past um, tried to make these comparisons. We've published about it. Um, I, I think I would say that the situation in the Donbass is evolving quite um, in a way that uh, the situation elsewhere is not. Uh, because elsewhere, with the exception, of course, of recent events in Karabakh, the lines, the, um, the political stalemate, for a better term, has been in place for almost 30 years, whereas obviously in eastern Ukraine, the situation is only five or well, six or seven years old. Um, I did remember or did think when, when uh, Gwendolyn was answering an earlier question uh, about the differences between our results and the ZOAS results. Of course, uh, what we should do now <laughs> is follow up and um, we actually engage in a kind of an experiment, in other words, uh, change the um, location of the um, companies that are asking the question and see if the results change. As a, uh, and that would be a good way to uh, kind of check on whether what we're looking at here is an artifact of the nature of polling versus uh, real changes on the ground. Can I just add to that? I completely agree with the latter part, and I would like us to to do that. But uh, also on the comparison I mean, between different um, areas of conflict or de facto statehood, uh, I think it's also important to to realize that or to to emphasize that um, contact across lines, borders, um, however we want to describe them, is is much more restricted in the in the Donbas case. I mean, access across this contact line is is um, so difficult and so limited, whereas, I mean, Transnistria is a very different um, case by now, and also Abkhazia is, is different. So it's, it's I think, um, that ongoing war, but also even the possibility, the physical possibility of crossing is is um, uh, the most limited among those those cases. I mean, Agora Karabakh is, a, is, a, is, 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 is probably a similar similar case in some ways now, but uh, if we look at Transnistria, Abkhazia, I think that is a, that is a difference. Um, yeah, very briefly on that, um, the question, um, and this came up when uh, Gwendolyn and a number of others and I spoke in Paris uh, last year about this. Um, the Donbass is different in terms of size. Uh, it's different in terms of time. The fact that the, this was a conflict that broke out 
uh, you know, two decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's different in terms of uh, the context, the geopolitical context, which is really a lot more tense, a lot more about, uh, about uh, Euro-Atlantic integration than the, the particular context that give rise to uh, the territorial conflicts in Georgia, the territorial conflicts in, um, uh, obviously, in, in Karabakh, but also in Moldova. So it's different. It's really very different, and it's uh, the size issue is, I think, a very, very important one. And and that's, I think, one of the frustrations that um, that I have, and uh, I'm sure others too, uh, which is that because there's such a hot geopolitics surrounding it, um, that it, it is seen as a, the, the sort of causality arrows are all from sort of Washington, Kiev, Moscow, uh, as if, you know, Putin decides exactly what is happening in the Donbass and that uh, uh, Washington decides what's happening in Kiev and the like, is that that sort of thin geopolitics uh, doesn't capture, it's, 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 it's causality in one particular scale, uh, and it doesn't capture the uh, conflicts between Ukraine and, and Russia, and then uh, conflicts within Ukraine over the a very a notion of what the Ukrainian nation is and what the who's who's part of the nation and who is not, um, and all of these are concentrated in this particular conflict. And um, so I think it's really quite distinctive and different. And um, as a sort of a wrap up here, um, I thought that perhaps I, I would ask a uh, Mikhail. Uh, Alexeyev, and then also Keith Darden to articulate their sort of comments that they have made in the chat uh, as, a, as a way of uh, getting us towards the conclusion. So, um, Mikhail. Hello. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I made a comment uh, regarding pensions and I uh, actually thought of my father who in the 90s moved from Ukraine to Russia uh, in, to a great extent because his pension was low and he qualified for the Russian pension since he worked in the Soviet Union. And because he was also a Chernobyl liquidator and the Chernobyl pay was three times higher in Russia than it was in Ukraine. So definitely something to consider. But I also understand that it's a much more complex question. Because, for instance, even though my dad moved when uh, Maidan happened and he saw how Putin was supporting Yanukovych oppressing the protesters, he became extremely anti-Putin. So, you, you know, ju just the economic things are not necessarily everything. And then the, 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 the thing today, I think, for non-government controlled territory is also that issue of pensions that they still receive from Ukraine and, and uh, people would uh, for years would cross over to withdraw their Ukrainian pensions, um, the relationship between Hryvnia pensions and what they get in rubles, because as I understand, most of the economy there in the non-government control areas is ruble based now. So that, that would be another thing. And, and I also added a thing on citizenship, uh, because there's been a big drive uh, spearheaded by Putin, even during the lockdowns. Uh, with the COVID, they still had bus tours to Rostov uh, uh, Oblast in Russia to get Russian citizenship. And I believe over to probably over 250,000 by now residents there, a significant uh, chunk of the local population already have Russian citizenship. So I, I wonder if you captured any of those things. I, I can answer that, uh, Mikhail, quickly. Um, I'm just looking at the um, summary results for the uh, non-government controlled areas, the uh, ENR and the LNR. And the question we asked was, um, do you have an international passport? It's not, I mean, it's as close, I, I think, as we can get to what you're asking. And the uh, only 14% said yes in the sample. And of those, 78% said they had a Russian passport um, and 10% um, Ukrainian. And then there was a couple of Armenian and others. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, I think it, in a sense, if the passportization um, continues at the, uh, the current and even greater rate, you would expect that ratio to go up. But, but anyway, that's our um, result. It's a pretty small ratio right now, but it's overwhelmingly uh, Russian passports. Oh, okay, so uh, Keith and then uh, Flavia. 
Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, and this is just kind of a follow up on my earlier question. You know, you guys have a remarkable finding of uh, significant variation across the line of contact, right? Which was really an arbitrary divide of these oblasts, uh, a function of, you know, sort of the accidents of warfare. And so the question is, where does that, you know, where did the survey responses that we're getting the differences across that divide come from? And one might be that, you know, there's been some kind of population sorting and these populations are really different now. Another might be that their experiences are very different. Uh, but I think the one that I, that I find uh, that we need to think about a way to examine is that there's just a significant difference in social desirability bias or political desirability bias on either side so that on the on the government controlled side, they are not as comfortable, perhaps, saying that uh, they would like to join Russia. And on the uh, DNR LNR side, they're clearly not as comfortable saying that they would like to rejoin Ukraine uh, without autonomous status. And so you're getting really stark differences in the status question, but you're not getting stark differences in, uh, in on questions that we think there might be less political desirability bias or social desirability bias, like the, I just want to live in a country where the wages and pensions are higher, right? Yeah. And this is why my earlier question was not so much about do people just choose to live where, uh, is the sovereignty question being decided based on where wages and pensions are, are higher, which it would be Russia. It's, is that question a safe way for them to dodge this political desirability bias? Uh, and I think that relates to the differences that you find in this survey and the 2019 survey, and the fact that Levada did the poll rather than, uh, you know, Kiev International Institute of Sociology. So just having Kiev uh, coming in the, uh, you know, in the in the lead up to asking some people questions in the DNR and LNR probably was a little bit, um, you know, biasing uh, for them. And so I just wanted you guys to think a little bit more about the. The ways, it's not so much that there are actual differences in attitudes, but different ways in which your survey is perhaps picking up uh, bias in the responses. Sure. I can, can I respond quickly to that and then others can join in. Um, on that question about political desirability bias and, and um, Keith just kind of hinted at it, that the selectivity of population movements may have led to, um, you know, growing divide in a sense between who is now in the uh, DNR, LNR versus those who are in the government controlled areas. And I, I was again reading, and I keep referring to this chapter by Von Twickle, and it's something that he emphasizes um, very much in, the, in his chapter, basically saying that um, the sorting has been, um, in, in some sense was driven by political motivations and um, that people, who uh, you know don't like the authorities or can't live in the uh, self-declared republics um, have moved out, and so what you get left behind is a population that is more committed, uh, proportionately, and more aligned with the authorities and with the uh, project. And and this goes back to, in some senses, uh, Vladimir's question, which we didn't really answer at the beginning, which was about the uh, role of TV and other kinds of government. Um, controlled uh, media efforts to build a separation, to build a divide. And so, in a sense, it's, it's applying um, pressure on an increasingly um, divided population to kind of stay on side, um, if you want to use the rugby term. And so, yeah, I, I, mean, I think that's a good point and, and certainly uh, something we really absolutely have to, uh, to probe more. But as I said earlier, I think a, a nice experiment would be to reverse the um, the survey companies and see what happens. Can I just, <clears throat> just in, jump in? I, I agree, and I think we, we just don't know to what extent displacement has has been this um, sorting mechanism, as, as you put it. Um, I suppose one element of that, however, will also be to take into account that a significant um, number of people have left the non-government controlled areas to go to um, the Russian Federation. So in, in a way, there's another so how that then plays together with those, what that means about those who are either stuck or choose to stay, probably most are more stuck than choosing to do anything. Um, but those who had the possibility or wanted to go to 
the Russian Federation also have done so, and numbers vary between 500,000 and a million. So they are usually not so much talked about as internally displaced in in um, the rest of Ukraine. Um, but I think that would have to be somehow part of this this um, dynamic too. But we need to think about how how to prove this um, further. Um, while I like this idea of this experiment, I just wanted to to clarify the 2019 survey was not the telephone survey was not done by Keith. So I think that um, seemed like a very obvious. Um, uh, problem. So there, the idea was um, to have a, a completely outside um, uh, agency um, uh, based in in the UK, but with local researchers. So a little coming in a little more low key um, through Kharkiv. So, um, but the same problem still with ringing from Kharkiv and, and respondents regularly ask where the call is coming from and who's behind it. Um, the problem doesn't go away with that, but it wasn't as prominent as as Keys is conducting um, this survey. Um, Flavia, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is about uh, the local identity of People's Republic. So um, I don't know if after all these years of conflict, we can see that uh, People's Republic have developed a local identity which is different from Ukrainian. And, and if yes. If the answer to this question is yes, whether uh, and how this uh, local identity um, has an impact of the national identity of uh, Ukraine. I don't know if you understand my question. Yes. Shall I? Okay. Shall I make a start? Um, in the 2016-19 surveys, we had a question on identities, actually no, for the telephone interview in the non-government controlled areas um, only in 2019. Um, and there we can see that it's um, uh, it's 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 um, many different identities, many of them um, not only cast in uh, Ukrainian and Russian, but around local local uh, identifiers, um, be it um, former oblast, be it the city, be it very local, also Russian language, so a, a whole range. It wasn't a clear trend towards uh, a hardened uh, identity around um, the, the political units that have emerged, but definitely much more of a presence of uh, a number of ways of expressing a local um, local identity and also language identities and not, not just a big sort of Russian, Ukrainian, or in a very prominent mixed category, by the way, which in our definition of nationality here, we haven't included today. I mean, in terms of impact on Ukrainian national identity overall, if it if this refers also to Ukraine as a whole, um, we've done a few other surveys with keys on the whole of Ukraine, and I think there the effect is that generally in recent years the war is one factor behind a strengthening of a of a civic identity in Ukraine as a whole. Um, uh, so not an, a clear kind of ethnic identity but a civic in understanding the Ukrainian state and being being citizens of the Ukrainian state um, that we can see in, in data across across Ukraine strengthening. Um, very, very briefly, because I think we have to finish up here um, just to uh, to respond to T's excellent uh, point about uh, social and political desirability. Uh, the survey does allow you to say you neither distrust nor trust the authorities. It does allow you to uh, say, do not know, refuse to answer. So we can get a measure of uh, the degree to which certain questions are sensitive. Um, but, uh, and also to address that last question about the, the People's Republics, independence is an option uh, and it was very, very low. So that, I think that's a sort of a, uh, an indication that uh, you know people are not invested in, in them in any to any uh, great extent. Um, all of this is to say that um, I, those things are real, um, but there are ways in which you can use the data to try to um, uh, to pa paint a, a picture uh, of the complexity uh, of um, uh, positions. Uh, of people uh, across these two areas. Um, Marlene? Yes. So we are out of time, I understand. Yeah, I mean, if you still want to take one or two questions, uh, uh, we can, of course, do that. Um, 
Okay. Are there any uh, further um, um, comments that you want to make in response to um, the interventions that have been made so far, Jono? Um, yeah, uh, just on this question from uh, Flavia, um, I thought you were going to answer it by reference to what's been well identified for a long time is the sense of a local identity, kind of a Donbass identity that was really quite uh, distinctive and um, was evident, um, you know, even in the immediate, well, in the Soviet times, or even in the most immediate post-Soviet times. And I mean, Vladimir will, will remember uh, our fieldwork in the Donbass in the mid nineties. And, um, you know, what one got a sense there was of this really strong attachment to the region, to the special character of the industry and the industrial base of the region. And this has been, um, documented quite well um, by, uh, let's see who, who, I guess Elisa Giuliano has, has done it, right? And- um, yeah, Andrew Wilson has that article too uh, in Europe Asia Studies, um, exploring it. Yeah, and, and so I think the, um, that is a kind of a, a key um, idea that I think is still alive. Now, of course, the question is, has that identity been kind of shattered? By the uh, the line on the ground, right? The line of contact, the the, uh, the line along which, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of incidents happened last year. Um, you know, maybe it has no longer this kind of coherent identity uh, for the whole of the two oblasts. Um, maybe now, and this would be an interesting thing to explore, that it's now associated, you know, on one side, uh, this is the People's Republic side, and, and maybe less so on the other side, maybe that is becoming more of an attachment to Kiev and to a broader Ukrainian identity. But I think it's worth uh, remembering the um, long-term um, elements of identity in the region that were really, really very important and, and really quite distinctive within the Soviet period and then the post-Soviet period. Would you like to continue the discussion? Or do we conclude? I guess final remarks, uh, Gwen, do you want to say a few? And then I can say a few words and wrap it up. I don't think there, I don't see other questions. Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add. I just wanted to kind of make this point again. And I think, I think you, you emphasized it before, Gerard, as well, that I, I hope that there is this space to do um, this kind of work and discuss it as we have done here today with with um, a great audience um, acknowledging all the methodological difficulties, but at the same time um, not not completely ruling out that one can and should do this kind of research. So I mean, often I think we get um, even if the Ukrainian foreign ministry hasn't been in touch yet. Um, uh, there, there, there is pushback um, if there's something that is uncomfortable for for one political side, and and this could be uncomfortable for um, kind of a more Ukrainian um, political perspective. But this should not, and and we realize that the conditions for conducting surveys are far from ideal. But I think all our um, um, uh, sort of uh, assumption there is that we one should still try, otherwise one is very far away from what local uh, people actually think and want, and and so that can't be the alternative, even even though it's messy and it's methodologically difficult, and we're not quite sure how to interpret certain things. But um, the the attempt to actually go straight to people directly affected by by war and everything that goes with it, um, uh, sort of we all I think. Um, um, sort of stand for, and I think that requires a certain space and also a willingness to, to discuss this. And, and we've had it today, but it's not always the case. Um, yeah, I would just like to uh, to point out that yeah, there's a lot of great researchers working in this field, um, international and also Ukrainian. Uh, and uh, folks should look out for their research. Uh, we've mentioned the Beyond Frozen Conflicts book, but I'd also like to mention the International Crisis Group report um, that the uh, folks that study Ukraine have done. I think it's a terrific report. And there's one line in that report, which was very uh, powerful. And this gets to the question of pensions, where they interview this woman who says, yes, she goes across the 
um, the border to uh, the government controlled areas to get a pension. Uh, and, you know, together the pensions are about 150 or $200. And she said, jealous, you know, I live in rubbles. Uh, in rubble, uh, in a war-torn area, are you jealous? So the degree to which that uh, the sort of so-called uh, pension tourists have been vilified in Ukraine, I think, is uh, undermines the uh, the sort of stated aspirations of Ukraine, which is that these are Ukrainian citizens, uh, and I think that we need a little more empathy for the particular conditions that people are living under in the in this area. Well, I think that was a wonderful way to conclude this event. I really wanted to thank you for the incredible data uh, you have been able to gather and for trying to keep all the granular and the nuanced aspects of this really sensitive question. And I would like to thank our audience for being so interactive. It's really wonderful when we can have this kind of uh, very lively discussion. And we hope well to have, host you here at IRIS and PONAS for the next round of your uh, uh, research on the region or on the, the rest of the post-Soviet um, uh, space. So once again, thank you so much for being here today, wishing everybody well, and we will be waiting for more publication coming from all the data you collected. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.